We're going to hear from what I believe, honestly, this is not a pulpit platitude. Um, but I believe one of the greatest voices that God has raised up for this generation, for this time. Uh, she comes all the way from Orange County, California. Come on, which I have publicly said is the only city outside of Dallas that I would move to because the weather over there, I just it speaks to me. Her and her husband pastor a phenomenal church called the Father's House and OC. She is a phenomenal biblical teacher, a preacher. She's an author. She's going to tell you more about her latest book. Her name is Bianca Oltoff. She is in the house. Y'all, this is her first time here at Social Dallas. It will not be her last. She wrecked the building first service, so get ready. I told her this is the turn up service. So come on, Social Dallas family. Would you help me give a warm Social Dallas welcome to Bianca? Social Dallas, I need everyone still to remain standing because we're gonna give honor where honor is due. Uh, as always, we are honoring the name above every other name, which is the mighty name of Jesus. But under the leadership and authority of the pastors that are here, pastors Robert and Taylor, can we give them a great round of applause for taking care of their soul, taking care of their soul because the church is only as healthy as the pastors. And not to be outshined, but the amazing volunteers and the staff that has held it down for the last four weeks. Can we thank them? Oh, come on, church. We can do better than that. They've been serving you, taking care of your kids, parking your cars. Amazing, amazing. Well, good morning. Welcome to church. Y'all can be seated. Oh. You know what I love? I love that your pastors care about the condition of their heart. They care about tending to the soil of their soul because like I mentioned, a church is only as healthy as the church leadership. Now, I don't say this because I am a pastor. I say this because I was raised in a pastor's home, okay? So I saw it firsthand. And I love that they have actually set the bar for me in taking multiple weeks off just to to get right with God, to get tight with God, to, to get a download. But I was raised in a Christian household. My daddy's a pastor. He's actually still preaching right now in East LA. Listen, I might live in OC, OC but I was raised in LA, okay? In fact, it's not the bougie, like, no, we're from the West Side. No, I'm from East LA, all right? Where we love Jesus, but we will cut somebody real quick, all right? And then pray for God to heal you later. Anybody feel me? Any relatives? Yeah. All the Mexican cholas are like, that's right, girl. I know, I know, I'm with you, I get you. But I will say this about our house, although we didn't have uh, what we would deem like a Sabbath, every week we would have Friday family fun night. And on family Friday fun night, we were promised a couple of things. We were promised that it was payday. Hello, praise the Lord. Because pizza always equaled payday. We were promised fun and we were promised time with our family. Well, this was always such a highlight for us. And so uh, every Friday fun night, it came with pizza. Now, before you bougie Dallas people think like artisan dough and vine ripened tomatoes with fresh pulled mozzarella, nah, it's better. Does anybody know Little Caesar's Pizza? That's right, that's right. For our global family, it's basically the McDonald's for pizza and it's everywhere and it's cheap. And for our family that we were, you know, on a budget, that buy one, get one free pizza deal works within our family budget. So on Fridays, my mom would let us cycle, me and my twin sister Jasmine, on our bikes to a Little Caesar Pizza. Now this is a big deal because it wasn't safe in our neighborhood. Maybe you guys rode your bikes everywhere in suburbia. But, but he, where we are from, we lived in hood Burbia, so it wasn't safe. And if you ever forgot who really ran the street, streets, the graffiti on the walls let you know who really ran the streets. So it was a little, little dangerous, but it was like four o'clock, the sun's still out. My mom trusted us, gave us money. We went to Little Caesars. We gave the guy uh, behind the counter, unthu unenthusiastic as all get out, definitely needed Jesus, but we smiled, gave him $10 and walked out with our pizza. Now, before we had gotten on our bikes to go home, we noticed that there was a group of, of, of young kids on their bikes that made a semicircle around us. Now, I was a little terrified. See, these weren't the gangbangers that maybe we saw growing up running the streets, but definitely were like their baby cousins, okay? It was like the junior varsity version. They stood on their bikes and one of the leaders said, give us your pizza. Well, I was terrified and I couldn't even get words out of me. All I could do was just shake my head like this. But Jasmine had a resolve and she let out a defiant no. Well, her courage gave me confidence and I felt like I was bad. I said, 
let's get out of here. Like I wasn't even afraid. So um, with one look, because that unspoken twin language is really a thing. She looks at me, I look at her, bombastic side eye. We get on our bikes and we zoom past them and I made a barricade. So she had the pizza. I was in front of her and we zoomed to our house and boom, before you knew it, we were at our family dining room table for family Friday fun night with pizza, praising the Lord, okay? Praising the Lord. Now, before I, we, we talk about, well, why does this matter is because the promise of what we knew and what we were carrying, the pizza was a promise that we were, pro that we were good to have fun that night. This food might not seem like a big deal to you, but to us, living in not abject poverty, but working poor poverty, it was like what the children of Israel would refer to as manna. I wasn't gonna give up my manna. I wasn't gonna let go of what God had promised us and had given us. And let me tell you, this is what I wanna talk about tonight, friends, because if you never envision the end, you'll give up in the middle. Don't let nobody take your pizza. Because let me tell you something and hear me ever so clearly. You're too close to quit. That's in fact the title of the today's message. You pull out your notes, your notebooks, your highlighters, and your pens. And turn with me to Joshua chapter six, because you are too close to quit. Now, as you turn in your Bibles, let me give you a little appetizer before we dive into the main course. This is uh, a little bit of Hebrew history. Uh, the children of God were enslaved for over 400 years under the oppressive hand of Pharaoh. And the Lord heard the cries of the people. He said, I have heard the cries, I have seen their tears. And under the leadership of a man named Moses, they left slavery. They crossed over on dry ground on the Red Sea. And now after 40 years of, of being in the desert, they're under the authority of a new man by the name of Joshua. And as they're about to head into the promised land, more on that in a second, as they're about to head into the promised land, they encountered a challenge. And this is where we pick it up in the text, Joshua. Chapter six, verse one. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. If you brought your Bible, I want you to circle that in your Bible. If you didn't bring your Bible, but you sat next to someone who did, circle it for them. It's called biblical graffiti. I'm about it. East Los represent, all right. Some of y'all didn't bring your Bibles and I'm like, Dallas, this is the Bible Belt. Y'all need a Bible and if you don't have one, I'm gonna put Pastor Taylor and Robert on the spot. Guess what? You go to the, 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 the Welcome Center and the free gift that they're gonna give you isn't gonna include a Bible if you don't have one. All right, all right, we ready. It says that the city was securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out, no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for how many days? Six. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns on the front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city how many times? Good job, church. This side is the holy side. Let me ask that again. How many times, church? Mm, mm. With the priests blowing trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army, the whole army, give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. What is that? That's a promise. God made a promise to Joshua. And all across this room in our online global family, there's promises not yet possessed by the people of God. And you could be sitting here today and be like, well, that's for the Hebrews. God gave a specific word for them. Thank you, YouTube theologian. You're right. But I also believe that God gives his people promises for today. In fact, there are general promises that God promises us. That, that God gives us a future and a hope. God does have plans for good and evil. God says that he will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He will never abandon you. Those are promises for us to hold. And the Bible is full of promises for us to hold on to and not give up in the waiting. But I'm grieved. I'm grieved because I see so many people who profess Christ and yet walk away from the promise. I see people leaving churches because someone offended them. I see people walk away on marriages just because you're tired of trying. I see people who are quitting jobs because your boss expects you to show up on time and not come in with a Starbucks cup in your hand and then you give attitude as to why they're course correcting you. The audacity. No, get your life, show up on time, come with a smile. Like that's not spiritual warfare, that's being an adult. Can I get an amen in the house of God? 
Okay. Don't let somebody steal your pizza. Because just as Friday night, fun night, pizza was a promise to us, the children of God were promised something. Does anyone know any word nerd and Bible scholar put in the chat box or shouted out, what were the children of God promised? Land. Land. That's right. Sit on the first row. That's right. Get your 500 extra bonus points, sis. Yes. You single? Somebody better snatch her up. That's right there. A Boaz in the house. Girl, I better prophesy. Oh, you look cute too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Men, please come serve at, <laughs> at Social Girl. All right. There you go. But the Lord promised them a land. He promised them a land. He said, this land will be yours. That's a promise. So you know what the children of God needed in this moment? Spiritual resiliency. You know what we need in this moment? In this cultural moras of what we are going through society, you know what we need to, as children of God? Spiritual resiliency. Now I've studied the topic of grit and resiliency for two years. It started just as, as, as an inquiry. What is it? Who has it? How do you build it? And it is turned into this obsession that I cannot help but put over a lens and filter a grid, if you will, when I read scripture. This is fascinating because I am seeing so many Christians give up when they're so close to winning the battle. And we quit because we don't have grit. And maybe that's you today. You're so tired of trying to do everything right and everything is still so wrong. You're you're frustrated because you believe God. You come to church, you're sowing, you're tithing, you're giving, but your life hasn't changed. You're disappointed of doing all the right things and yet all the wrong things are constantly happening. Now, there is scientific study and so much data. I mean, coming out from some of the top universities of our nation and the globe about what is grit and resilience. Now, we don't really see those words in the Bible, but we do have a theological understanding of grit and resilience and that is perseverance and endurance. The Lord speaks to us and I want to speak through his word because there are gritty and resilient people that are in this community that will change not just their community, but have potential to change the country and the globe. We pray for things like, God, we want to see revival. God, use me. God, bless me. But then we don't want anything in our life to change and we don't definitely want to work hard. It doesn't work like that. Do you know and I've discovered in over two and a half years of research that resilient and gritty people possess three similar characteristics. These three similar char characteristics do not depend on gender, social economic status, ethnicity, or social connectedness, AKA clout, no. The things that I'm about to share with you, if you use as a lens and filter over the grid of scripture, you will see that every biblical character was a gritty gangster. I don't know if the Lord will call them that, but I'm gonna call them, I'm gonna call them that. I'm gonna look at you and I'm gonna ask and declare the same things over you. So I wanna lead with the end in mind. I wanna tell you what these three characteristics are because you're gonna know where we're gonna go. The first characteristic that we see of all gritty and resilient people is a perspective. They have a healthy perspective. Then they have an inordinate ability to pivot well. And then lastly, they understand the purpose. They might be in pain, but what is the purpose of the pain? And I chose this passage out of Joshua to dive into the word because we're actually gonna see these three points played out. So if we know that those are the characteristics, thank you science, thank you scripture, what are the things that stop us from, from chasing after our calling and pursuing our purpose? Number one for the note takers, we lose perspective. We lose perspective. What is perspective? Perspective is an honest assessment of our reality with hope. Basically, it's like, oh, this situation sucks, but we're going to make it. Right. It's an honest assessment. It's not putting your head in the sand and trying to pray it all away. God is good all the time and all the times God is good and I'm just going to read scripture and get over it. No, 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 no. It's an honest assessment buttressed by hope. For the Israelites, it's a promise. And the promise is that they will inherit a land that's promised to them. But there's a problem. Now, you have to know there's always a problem standing between God's promise and our possession. See, we love to teach about the promises of God, that God is for us, that he has a plan. We love that. And we want to hold on to that because it's easy. We love the idea of like God has a plan for me, that there's a purpose for my life, that he could take my pain and my shame and use it for his glory and for his good. Amen. Hallelujah. We love to speak with Christian platitudes and speak this language. You guys are fluent in the South. I don't know if y'all know this. It's called Christianese. Do you know what Christianese is? 
It's the language that we as Christians use as insider language. Let's try it. God is good all the time and all the time, God is good. you're fluent. Amen. We walk in and say, hallelujah, he's risen indeed, glory to God. You almost beat your children on the way to church, but then you take them over to kids' church and you're like, here's my cherubim and my seraphim. I feed them manna this morning. They're going to be so good. We love coming to church with our plastic faces. I'm from Orange County. What I like to say is that the Botox that is in our face has crept its way into our hearts so that nothing moves. We love coming with our Christian platitudes. But God has always been about meeting people in real pain and whispering truths over their life. And I believe he wants to do the same for us in here today. Now, there's always a problem. Look at the, from this passage, what's the problem? The problem is the city called Jericho. Look at verse one again. Now the gates of Jericho were secured, uh, were securely barred because of the Israelites. So scripture says that the reason that Jericho was locked up was because the children of God. Well, pause for the cause. Why are they worried? Oh, because they heard. They heard about this people that said that they were the children of Yahweh, the one true God, and their God parted the Red Sea. Their God freed them out of slavery. Their God dried up the Jordan River so that they can walk over into Jericho. Now, the walls were locked. The city was impossible to get into. We don't have time, but I'm a word nerd. And a walled city was actually a two-walled city. You had one wall that came roughly around a 70, uh, 70 degree angle. But then on top of that, there was a wall that was 90 degrees. So if you were able to scale one wall, you definitely were not able to scale the one that was a 90 degree angle straight up. It was impossible. But you know what scripture says? What is impossible for man is possible for God. And maybe, maybe the thing that in your life that feels barricaded and tightly shut up isn't because you're not supposed to have it. Maybe the reason why you feel like your promise is barricaded and shut up is because the enemy knows if you get it, you will have so much confidence in the sovereignty, the goodness of God, that it will not ever stop you from pursuing his promise. Now then, something comical happens. I, I love, um, a Bible is full of irony. And people who say like, oh, the Bible's boring. No, boo, you boring. You're boring. That's why you think the Bible's boring. See, I read my Bible like it's a novella. I'm Mexican, So I read this, I know you guys watch like Days of Our Lives. Uh-uh, we grew up with 10 pounds of makeup, screaming, somebody gets shot, you find out it's the secret baby daddy and you, you watch the TV like, oh my gosh. Guess what? I read the Bible the same way. And when we see this, when we hear this, when we read this passage, this is the irony here in verse two. Look at, read verse two. God says, see, I have delivered Jericho in your hands. I'm a writer. So I read this and I'm like, excuse me, Yahweh. That is grammatically incorrect. See, see the tenses are wrong, but there's no mistake in God. He is prophetically declaring the battle has already been won. The problem with verse two is, is verse one, that the, scripture, that the city is tightly barred up. So the question that I'm asking us this morning is, what do you do when what God has said doesn't look like what you see? What do you do when God is speaking things over your life that haven't yet materialized? You come to church with faith and hope but you realize you walk out these doors and your reality still remains the same. How is your perspective? If I'm honest with you, that's where I am. God has promised me things in my heart that I haven't yet seen. <laughs> Thanks mom, appreciate that. Just kidding, it's not my mom. It's a prayer team, go seek them after service. I know what God has shown me in my heart and in my mind. In my reality, it doesn't look any further than that. I have every excuse to throw in the towel and quit. Because sometimes what we see doesn't look like what God has said. And the enemy wants to use every problem in our life to mess with our perspective. Because the truth is, there's a city. Jericho was a small city, but the walls were high. And this was the first city that the children of Israel were gonna have to conquer in order to get to the promised land. Because once 
Jericho was conquered, there was AI. And after AI, there's other cities that would, they would need to conquer to get into the full ownership of the promised land. Joshua crosses over the Jordan and he's met with a walled city, but it didn't matter what he saw because he believed in what his God said. So what do you do when you only see walls? So many people quit because we lose our perspective. We see nothing but walls. I want you to know that whatever you are staring at isn't a sign that you're not supposed to have it. It's a sign that you might need to change your perspective. God, what are you doing here? God, there's a wall, but God, you also gave me a promise. So though I can't scale the wall, you're going to teach me how to walk around it. And just as God promised Joshua a physical land, do you know that we have promises from God? Scripture says that we have every spiritual blessing, but there's a problem. Just because God promised it doesn't mean that I possess it. I don't possess it because God promised it. There's some work that will take place and the enemy will erect walls in your life to keep us from inheriting the promises of God. So I want us to be like the psalmist who says, I look to the heavens to see where my help comes from. My help is from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Don't look at your walls, look at your maker. Look at your maker, get your perspective right. And that's my story. Girls like me, first generation American girls, we don't go to college. No, we repeat the generational statistics of our family. We live in the concrete jungles of urban cities, living off of uh, a government help or family assistance. Girls like me don't go to college. Girls like me don't become a Bill Gates Millennium Scholar. Subtle flex. <laughs> Girls like me don't go to graduate school and graduate graduate school with a 4.0 on a full ride scholarship. Oh, shout out Yahweh, thank you. But girls like me do get rejected from seminary because I'm a woman. What happens when what God has said doesn't look like what you see? Maybe for you, it's, you know, I've tried being in shape. I've tried getting healthy, but the doctor told me that I'm, pre, I'm genetically predisposed to obesity. My, my grandma's obese. My mother's obese. I'm obese. And this is just the life that I have to live. I've got to fulfill every stereotype. Maybe the lies that you've been leaving is that like my marriage is going to end in divorce because my parents' marriage ended in divorce and their parents' marriage ended in divorce. And, you know, divorce is just in our family. Or maybe you're sitting here today thinking like, I'm always going to be single. God, what are you doing? I don't know how to fix this. I have been praying for somebody. Or maybe you have prayed for somebody and God gave you that prayer and now your prayer has shifted to, why did you give me this person, God? Your prayer went from God, send me a man to God, kill this man. What walls have been erected in our lives? I'm going to ask you not to lose vision. What are the ways that we are tempted to quit? We lose perspective. We're tired and we don't see progress. Why, why are we tempted to quit? We don't see progress. See, Newton's third law of motion says that for every action, there is an equal and corresponding reaction. Y'all didn't know you're gonna get science today. I was homeschooled, boom. So we step on the gas, the car goes. We step on the brake, the car stops. We love progress, movement, and knowing how to maneuver our situation. Now for me, I love progress. I am not an Enneagram three and I don't care about like conquering things, but I do love a good to-do list. And you wanna know something? I'm so neurotic. I like writing things on my to-do list that I've already done just to get the satisfaction of going grrr, scratching it off and saying, look at how accomplished I am today. Any relatives in the house? Yeah, you're all OCD just like me. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. God is about to have a conference call with Joshua. He's like, hey, Joshi, this is the plan. You're going to go up against these, 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 you're going to go up against uh, those, the people of Jericho, but I'm going to be with you and I'm going to show you things that you've never seen before. Here's the game plan. All right. I'm thinking Joshua military. I'm thinking conquered Pharaoh's uh, army. I'm thinking, get the swords, get the spears, get the shields. We're going to battle. It's a scene of 300. Hurrah! It's gladiator. Okay. Here's, here's God's plan. All the men in Dallas are like, that's what's up. Look at verse three. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for how many days? 
Verse four, have the seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, up, everyone straight in. We love having plans, but then God shouts, pivot. We love a game plan. We love a game plan. You wanna know a hallmark for resilient, gritty people. You have the ability to determine, if this isn't working, I have to figure out what will. And maybe that's the point that you're at today. God is about to send the Israelite army to march. That doesn't feel scary. That doesn't feel intimidating. You, if I'm Joshua, I'm imagining, okay, so we're gonna march and then what? Think about this. Joshua is a Middle Eastern man, stereotypically, probably hairy, hairy chest, hairy arms, hairy knuckles. He's a warrior. He'd been trained with the best. He'd gone up against some brilliant warriors and God is asking him to march. God gave him a game plan and I believe that God has given many of us in here game plans, but you don't know what to do. Maybe you worked in corporate America, but now you find yourself changing 75 diapers because the Lord had you pivot to become a full-time parent. Maybe you lost your job and you have every excuse not to tithe, but the Lord's asking you pivot and give in faith. Maybe you have an amazing job and it's everything to you, but you can't help but sense that the Lord is calling you into full-time ministry and you know that you have to serve with a greater capacity here at Social Dallas, pivot. Maybe you thought that you were gonna marry this person because you've been dating for three years and now you realize that God is whispering to you, this is not the person for you, pivot. This is how the plan's gonna work, God's telling Josh. What is God telling you today? Because we as the people of God, we walk by faith, not by sight. Now, if you know the story, spoiler alert, if you know the story, we know that the walls come tumbling down and everyone like, high fives, fist bumps, chest bumps, like it's a party, it's a celebration. But, but I think what I need us not to lose is the nuance of this scripture. They do the same thing for six days. I'm a test us. I'm a vacation Bible school kid. I'm also an Awanas kid. I'm also a recovering Baptist. So I love the word of God, right? And I love legalism. Pray for me, pray for me. Um, for biblical numerology, does anyone know what the number six represents in scripture? Man, yes, Bible scholars. Yes, amazing. This is fascinating. So they watched for six days and nothing happened. So when you find yourself, we're gonna revisit six again, but when you find yourself marching six days, this is what I want you to do. This is what I'm doing. I want you to march even though you don't think it matters. I want you to march when it doesn't make sense. God, I don't know why you're doing this. I don't know when things are gonna change, but I wanna trust you. So I will march even though it doesn't make sense. This message is for someone who feels like they've lost perspective. This is messages for someone who doesn't see progress. And I want you to know that even though you don't see progress, it doesn't mean that your faith is weak. It doesn't mean that your prayers aren't perfect enough. God is doing something despite what you feel. And we learn to take another lap from our Hebrew family members. Even when nothing moves, even when bricks don't fall, even if there's not a shake, rattle and roll, take another lap. You know what that is? It's obedience. And maybe, just maybe, I don't know about you, but I will say for me, that God cares less about what is going on on my outside because he wants to transform me on the inside. Maybe God wants to do a internal work instead of just fixing your external. We see that the children of God obeyed. So Joshua calls the people around, look at verse eight, when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying seven trumpets. Ooh, that's interesting. Hmm, why is that included? Good question, Bible scholars. We're gonna figure out in a second. The Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. You know the Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God? Do you know that one of the biggest values of this house is the presence of God? That your pastors have cried out to the Lord and have said, if your presence don't, it doesn't go before us, we will not go. Why do we linger in worship? You're like, oh, I'm hungry, it's brunch time. No, 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 we wait to usher in the presence of the Lord. Verse nine, the armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guard followed the ark. 
All this time the trumpets were sounding, but Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Don't say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout. Sometimes the best strategy is to shut up and march. Because the more that you talk about it, the more you'll talk yourself out of it. Now, Joshua spoke to his leaders and he gave them instructions. He said, march. But you guys notice that he didn't tell them for how long? Golly, if I'm a soldier, I'd be the worst soldier. Because I have like so many why questions. Why? How long do we have to do this? Are we prepared? Do we bring snacks? I'm like not the warrior type. I wear fake eyelashes and high heels. When the Lord calls me to battle, I am like, why? Wouldn't it be nice if there was a game plan for life? A roadmap to indicate when this season would be done? See, so they went out on the first day and Joshua knew that they would have to march for six more days. But the children of Israel, they didn't. Look at verse 11. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the army returned to camp and spent the night there. Uh, this is speculation. The Bible remains silent, but again, I can't help to, as a word nerd to go into the pages of scripture and find little nuances or the things that I, I wonder, I wonder that on the first day when they walked around the city of Jericho, what did the people inside the city think? Maybe they thought, oh, they're, they're, they're getting a layout of our city. They're gonna know uh, some of our weak points. They're gonna have a strategy on what we're supposed to do. On the second day, they're thinking, hmm, maybe they just needed a little bit more reconnaissance before they took over the city. But on the third and the fourth and the fifth day, in my mind, the theater of my mind, I bet that they were laughing at the children of Israel. Like, how foolish, what are you doing? You're walking around again? Maybe they're throwing rocks or hurling insults. Let me tell you, that when you walk around your promises looking for breakthrough, there will be people that will hurl insults, that will laugh at you because they don't understand what God has promised you. Just because people don't understand it doesn't mean that you did not hear from God. Just keep walking. Just march when it doesn't make sense. Look at verse 12, Joshua got up early the next morning and the priest took up the ark of the Lord the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord, blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. On the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to camp. They did this for six days. The funny thing is, life doesn't tell us when we get to stop. Life doesn't tell you, hey, you're on the last lap. Life doesn't tell you, you just have two more rounds of chemo and then you'll be healed. Just keep on praying for 31 days, renew your mind and your child, your wayward child that's strung out on drugs and not even, not even like marijuana and cocaine is strung out on like angel dust and, cr and crank. I know there's someone in the room who you have a loved one that is strung out on the worst stuff. It's like the stuff that they make tied with. Somebody in here knows what I'm talking about. It would be nice if we had an answer. God's gonna do it now. God, I just need to know how long. I just need to know how long I have to deal with this pain. I just need to know how long I have to sit in my bed, my king bed, alone, waiting for a spouse. I just have to know how long the pain of my addiction is gonna cause me. I, I just need to know how long I have to live on the Dave Ramsey envelope system because I just want to be bad and bougie and I'm just bad and broke, God. Like, how long, how long? So just shut up and march. Just shut up and march because we give up when we lose perspective. We give up if we don't see progress and we give up when we don't see the point. It was a, a race. If you're familiar with track, uh, I ran track and there was the worst race of all track. It's the 3,200 3, meter race. Why is it the worst? Because it's so long. There's like 92, seven and a half laps. This is ridiculous. And as a runner, you can forget what lap you're on. And so what coaches do is they'll pull out a white flag to indicate that there's one more lap to go. And this is where you go all out. This is where you gas it out. This is where your knees are high and you're kicking up your legs. You're getting your stride in there. But life doesn't give us a proverbial white flag. In fact, Paul, the apostle, speaks about running the race. And the race that Paul talks about, there is no white flag. So what I see in the church is people raising their proverbial white flag, which in military is a sign of surrender. 
I give up. Because we don't see when God is giving us the last lap, we say, I'm done, I give up, it's gone. I don't wanna do it anymore. The reason why you can't stop marching is that you might be on the sixth lap and not even know it. Wouldn't it be a shame for you to walk away today? Wouldn't it be a shame for you to walk away and quit when you're so close? You are too close to quit. You can't stop marching. You can't let your emotions get the best of you. And let me tell you something, you can't put a, a, a threat on God, put, a, put trust, but because God loves you, because God loves you, Mario, you came in today and you were like, if God don't give me a word, I'm gonna take my life. And God gave you a word when Pastor, Pastor Robert was talking about at the beginning of service, um, the fear of man and the opinion of man. And before that, he gave a word about uh, taking your life. And let me tell you, for the man named Mario who came in and said, God, I just need a sign. He loves you. And he gave you a sign. Just keep marching. Just keep marching. The vital thing that resilient and gritty people need is a healthy perspective, an honest perspective, have the ability to pivot and find the purpose. God, I don't know why this pain is happening but I believe that you will take my pain and turn it into purpose. I may not know the why, but I'm trusting the who. The, high, the walls are high and it doesn't make sense. Now I know there's people in here that are just like, well, if God knows all, he can just knock down the walls. I mean, he promised us the city. Yes, he could. But when you get into Jericho, the Lord wants you to know that it wasn't in your strength. It was in his. We gotta work. We're a generation, we, we, we want it now with a tap, a touch, a swip, a swipe. We get it on our doorstep, we get it in our living room, we get it in our bed. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Galatians 6, 9 says, do not grow weary in doing good, for in due season you will reap a harvest. It's in the circling of the problem that God prepares us for the promise. God is preparing us for what he has prepared for us. We got to walk, we got to march, we got to put one foot in front of the other. Keep marching, keep marching, keep marching, keep marching. Your life matters, keep marching. Your job matters, keep marching. Your marriage matters, keep marching. Your kids matter, keep marching. There's a cynic in the room that's like, well, what if this isn't our last lap? What if I have to keep going? Act like every day is the seventh lap and one day it will be. So I'm gonna wake up every day. I'm gonna wake up every day and say, God, today's the day. Today's the day you're gonna do it. Today's the day you're gonna do it because six is the number for man. But what some nerdy Bible scholar tell me what the biblical number of seven means. Completion and perfection, come on Jesus. I will march because on the seventh day, the Lord is gonna complete it. Do you wanna know what today is, family? Today in the Hebrew calendar, it is the sixth day. So you came to church on a good day because you came to march and march and march because you act like today is the seventh and one day, baby, one day it will be. So we gotta have faith in God. Hey, Lord, I will give you my life and I will march when it doesn't make sense. There's people here in this room that you have have never heard a message of endurance and perseverance, grit and resilience. But maybe you feel like you wanna throw in the white tail. You wanna throw in the white flag of surrender. Do you know that you don't have to because we have a good savior by the name of Jesus, who spread his arms, not up in surrender, but out on a cross in the act of surrender. And he told his father in heaven in the garden of Gethsemane, I don't wanna do this, but not my will, yours and a sinless man died a horrific death on a cross on Calvary. He stretched his arms out and he said to tell us die, it is finished. And the veil separating God from man in the holies of holies tore from top to bottom because no longer, no longer, no longer do we need a mediator. No, 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 in the, in the great kismet kiss between humanity and the divine, we have direct access to a good God. And today, I don't want you to walk in your own strength because you're exhausted and you're tired and the burden on your back 
back feels too heavy, but I have come to tell you that there is one who says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. People, there are people in here who have never had a radical encounter with Jesus. And today is the day of salvation. I also know there's some jokers in here. Maybe you went to vacation Bible school, your grandma took you to church, or maybe you used to come here, but you've been living a life of sin. Today is the day where we repent. That means make a U-turn and come back to Christ. If you're here today, I'm gonna invite you, just will you do me a favor? Will you close your eyes and will you bow your head for our online family? We want you to be present, we want you to pray. But if you are watching online, someone sent you this link, it's for a reason. And the reason is that your salvation matters. And I'm gonna encourage you and let you know that you can walk in your own strength, but it'll closely kill you. But you can walk in the strength of the Lord and find the joy, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. If you're here today, you've never said yes to Jesus, I'm gonna count to three, and you're gonna raise your hand to boldly declare that you want Jesus, and maybe you're here today and you know that you've been living a life of sin. Not that you said a bad word, but you have been living in straight up sin and you wanna come back to the Lord. Today is the day of salvation. I'm gonna count to three, and you're gonna raise up your hand to declare, I want Jesus here in this room and online. One, by raising your hand, you are saying, I want Jesus to be the personal Lord and Savior of my life. Two, by raising your hands, you are saying that my mistakes and my failures, what the Bible refers to as sin, could be forgiven because what if Jesus did on Calvary? And three, the same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the grave will live in me, like Romans 10 says. If that is you, one, two, three, raise your hand. God bless you, God bless you. Oh, there's so many hands. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. God bless you online, online. Put a hand emoji in the chat box. God bless you, sir, by the back pole. God bless you, woman of God. God bless you in the back. In the very back, I can see you. I have my contacts on today. Praise God. Put your hand up if you need Jesus. If you're late to church, just put a hand up and confess. Just kidding. Just kidding. If you're here and you're saying yes to Jesus, raise your hand. There's hands all around this room to let you know, child of God, that you're not alone in this journey. We as a community of faith, we're going to pray with you. As a church body, can we surround our brothers and sisters who are confessing? And will you repeat after me? Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today I choose you as my Lord and Savior. Cleanse my head, cleanse my heart, cleanse my conscience. Fill me with your spirit to do what I cannot do and help me to march and march and march until the walls come down. In Jesus' name, can we celebrate church? Yes.